The following is a presentation of Second City Works, delivered by your earbuds at WGN+. Welcome to Second City Works, getting to yes and. I'm Kelly Leonard, creative advisor for the Second City. We are brought to you by Second City Works, which is the B2B arm of the world-famous Second City Theater. You can find us at secondcityworks.com. And this is more than just a podcast. It's about getting to the yes and moment in your work and your life. The term yes and is a key pillar of improvisation. It's at the front end of creativity. It's about building on ideas and making discoveries together. This is getting to yes and. Working all day for a mean little man With a clip on tight and a rub on tan He's got me running around the office like a dog around a track But when I get back home you're always there to rub my back my guest today is Sidney Finkelstein. Sidney is the Stephen Roth Professor of Management at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College and the director of Tuck's Center of Leadership. He is a consultant speaker to senior executives around the globe, as well as an executive coach, focusing on talent development, corporate governance, learning from mistakes, and strategies for growth. His new book is called Super Bosses. Welcome to our show, Sidney. Great to be on, Kelly. So your your book, Super Bosses, is terrific, and I, I found so many crossover concepts to the kind of improvisational work we do at Second City mm-hmm. Works and at Second City. Um, so this conversation could go on for hours, but it won't. We're going to do it in a tight half hour. Uh, but I want to give our listeners a general idea of the book's core thesis. So the most obvious question I'm going to set you up with is, what is a super boss? Right. Well, so a super boss is a boss, a leader that helps other people do more than they ever thought possible. And as a result, those do, their careers start to accelerate and do better and better than they ever thought otherwise. That's pretty much what it is. They generate tremendous talent. Yeah, and, and you know, you identify specific super bosses, and we'll talk about some of them, and you also uh, identify, you know, traits and, and, and different kinds mm-hmm. of themes. Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting because it correlates directly to a, a criticism or a concern I've heard for years, uh, mostly from agents and managers uh, with Second City, is how can you let talent go, uh, right? So we've been around for 60 years, and, and Bill Murray worked there, and Tina Fey worked there, all these brilliant people people, and, and we didn't keep them. But you, you actually sort of say in, in your book, uh, and I, I, I'll quote it, when the time is right, super bosses often encourage star talent to leave. That, that's absolutely right. And you know, um, it's a funny thing. Some executives have this idea that uh, they have a vote in whether their talent ends up going or not going. You know, yeah. People can do whatever they want. Right. You can't hold on to them if you don't want to hold on to them. And what super bosses have understood is that it's not just about getting great talents, not just about developing them, but actually, if you think about accelerating their career, helping them actually land a tremendous opportunity afterwards, which they're going to do, by the way, anyways. They're going to they're going to leave because you're helping them get better. You might as well try to be strategic about that. You might you might as well try to be beneficial, get some benefit out of that. And so, you know, one one quick example is Tommy Frist, the uh, longtime CEO of Hospital. Corporation of America, HCA. He had he, he was a great super boss. He had incredible talent. And when his senior people were at the point that they were ready to jump ship, what he ended up doing is actually creating a spin out business, a, you know, a surgical care center, a mental health clinic, and creating that opportunity for one of those people to become the CEO. And by the way, Tommy Frist and HCA became equity partners in those companies. So they actually benefited with the uh, on the upside of some of their best talent. Yeah, it's kind of an unusual thing because it, it requires, it, which in some cases, some of these super bosses are very egotistic, right? But it also requires them to be others focused uh, on the talent uh, and support them. So, you know, the, the correlation at Second City, of course, is um, uh, Tina Fey comes through, uh, we, we, Lauren Michaels comes in, sees her, puts her on Silent Live, and then every interview she's talking about her time at Second City, which reflects well back on the company, but also uh, has uh, an inspiring. Uh, um, a role in getting new talent to come because they want to be her. Uh, so it, it's it's an organic way that I think is probably surprising to people. Exactly right. I call that a talent magnet. That's what you become, right? Yeah. You become this magnet for 
uh, the, the world's best talent that that go to seek you out because they've seen what's happened with uh, with past um, uh, proteges and, and alums, and they want a piece of that action. It's a it's a very powerful thing. Yeah, and so a, a little fur- further and deeper because I think this is really interesting. Uh, this is another interesting zag. You write that super bosses don't want recruits who are very talented and smart. They want recruits who are unusually talented and startlingly smart. Can you tell us the nuanced difference with that? Well. Um, they uh, they love people. They expect people to think differently. They're, they they value creativity. They're big innovators in their uh, in their industries. Whether it's you know a George Lucas, uh, obviously in, um, in special effects in movies, or a Ralph Lauren fashion, they're big time innovators. And so they are always looking for people that will help them think a little bit differently. And that's not just about kind of knowing the answer to things. That's not that's not just about raw intelligence. There's another element there, which yeah, I'm smart, but I also uh, I also don't mind speaking up and saying I've got a different point of view. And for for super bosses, they they don't just want you to do that. That's really kind of what they expect you to do. They expect you to come ready to engage in a good argument, a good discussion, and come up with new stuff all the time. That's really what uh, what I was getting at when I tried to summarize what it is that that, that super bosses are looking for. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, is that an element of emotional intelligence that those recruits have to have and that the super boss has to have uh, that can allow friction not to devolve, but friction to help? Yeah, you know, some people do talk about that as emotional intelligence. I think this is almost emotional intelligence on steroids right. because they, they, they just go much further than your typical, uh, your typical manager, your typical leader. And, uh, and they do it because they're so driven to accomplish great things. And if that's their goal, if that's their purpose in life, why wouldn't they want to surround themselves with tremendous people? Why wouldn't they want to create an environment where there's a lot of discussion and debate and, and argument? You know, Larry Ellison, another famous uh, um, super boss, former uh, now chairman of Oracle, he loved a good argument. You wouldn't always win that argument against it, but uh, uh, he expected you to be able to push back and challenge. And I, I found that to be the case time and time again in interviewing super bosses and especially interviewing so many of, uh, of their protégés. Yeah, well, I love that you brought up Ellison because it, to me, uh, I, I can't, I, before reading this book, if you had told me that Alice Waters and Larry Ellison would be in the same <laughs> book, I would have said that is insane. So, <laughs> you know, what does, what, why, why would they both be in the, in the book? What, what, what connects them in this? Well, remember, the, ne- the main thing that defines what a super boss is is that, is that they are they are, they are geniuses at talent spotting. They develop a new talent. Yeah. They help other people get better. And, you know, their style and how they go about that is secondary. I did find actually three different styles of uh, almost personality styles of what's behind this, but they end up doing so much of the same thing. So Alice Waters is much more of a nurturer or iconoclast, you know, a creative type that wants to help other people get better. But I call, uh, I call Larry Ellison the, the glorious bastard the tough-as-nails person. But the thing that's important to keep in mind about, an, uh, about a Larry Ellison is he is so driven to win and understands at the same time that the only way to be the best is to have the best people around you and to create a, a team or a set of teams that, that can do almost anything. And to do that, you have to care about people at a certain level. You've got to find the right people, and you've got to develop them. And that's really what they have in common. They end up doing many of the same types of things. They start in really different places, but they end up doing so many of the same things. It's interesting. Uh, uh, on the podcast uh, last week, we spoke to Neil Stevenson, who runs uh, IDEO uh, here in Chicago, the IDEO office, the design company. Mm-hmm. And um, we talked a lot about this myth of the sole creative, the one person who, who does everything. Um, and, and so much of your book, uh, while it is about these bosses, it, it couldn't exist without these framework of other people. And I think that space between uh, the boss and, and these mentors is the most important relationship that allows them to excel and for great work uh, uh, to be done. Um, And one of Water's employees uh, noted that she's not someone who actually liked to boss people around, and and he's quoted as saying, what she does very well is that she can edit. She would always be walking through the kitchen just when you were struggling. So essentially, she would like nudge people in the right direction. Uh, And I I found that to be kind of a fascinating concept. Yeah, uh, it it was interesting in the sense that um, you think about how did how have people developed over time? How, how did somebody learn a craft mm-hmm. in their in their careers? And for centuries, we had a system, and the system called an apprenticeship. 
Right. And with very few exceptions, and I suspect Second City is one of those exceptions, mm-hmm. the apprenticeship model has gone out the door. Yep. You know, we, we, we've replaced it with education as if I'm in the world of education, you know, but uh, as if you can graduate from even the best school and you're just ready to, to, uh, to perform at the highest level. There's no replacement for right. the hand-to-hand, one-on-one interaction, and that's what super bosses do. Yeah, we, we talk about at Second City uh, creating safe spaces for people to fail uh, because, it, it, you know, in, in another uh, industry, they'd call that rapid prototyping. Um, but you really need to get your hands dirty and you're not going to develop resiliency uh, unless you're allowed to fail. And that, you know, apprenticeships, because you build this relationship, there, there's a lot of failure in that. And, and I think the, the classic super boss recognizes that and, and sort of writes it into the narrative of, of what the business is. Uh, writes it in, and, and you know more than anything else, uh, sewer boss. When it comes to this kind of one-on-one relationship with individuals, with with team members, they're they're teachers, they're coaches, and they do it in a very natural in a very natural way. And teaching doesn't only mean you know positive things in the sense that you know you're going to just support people, but when there's something to be said, they're not afraid to say it. Negative feedback is a core element in what uh, super bosses do. But they, in a sense, you know, they are building resilience because if you can't get back up after something not working so well and, 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 and a super boss expecting you to, to raise that game, then maybe you're not in the right place anyway. So there, there's an element of thick skin here that yeah. needs to be developed. And, and, uh, and it's part of the, the growth of any, any individual, I think, in, uh, in a job and to be, a, to be an effective team member. You've you got to be able to, uh, you got to be able to take the criticism and the feedback, and you got to be even better than that. You want to be open to it. You want to be looking for that. I, I always found that to be a big differentiator, by the way, for, for, for the best leaders in any organization, that they actually want to know how to get better. They are constant learners, and that requires finding out what's working and also what's not working. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, you know, I, I helped run uh, uh, Second City for uh, a couple decades, and and I know, man, that 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 it, that especially when you have it down, right, and things are going great, it's very hard to then change your orientation and realize, oh, I could have been doing this better, um, and accept that criticism. It's it's not an easy thing, and and I think that that differentiates um, the people you're talking about from people who are who are you know good bosses, but not super bosses. And and. Don't forget that one of the earliest warning signs for failure is tremendous success. In and of itself, right. success could be could be a very dangerous thing because you start to believe you know everything. Um, the twin evils of complacency and arrogance start to step in. You don't push yourself as, as much. You're not taking as many risks. And um, there's always somebody just waiting and, and excited to be able to take your place and take away some business from you. And um, that's part of uh, the nature of any of any organization. So uh, I think it's things to, uh, um, to rest on your laurels. That's something that, again, super bosses, I call them sharks in one place in the book, mm-hmm. they're always looking for something new. Miles Davis, and another really unusual super boss for the way most people would think about it, of course, you know, the jazz genius, the right. trumpeteer, cut for life to be sure. But he, uh, he, he invented multiple forms of, of music, really, in jazz. And he always was looking for something new, and he demanded that of the people in his band. Every single night when they went out to perform, he said, I want something new from you. If you got nothing new to offer, you, then don't come out on stage. And that's what they want. Right. And he, and, and he ended up having side players uh, uh, like John Coltrane, right, the, the, who became maybe even eclipsed, you know, uh, 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 Davis. I mean, everyone who played in Davis went on to um, amazing work. He was, he was a, you know, while probably an incredibly difficult personality, there was no question that um, he made these people better. He, he did. I mean, Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Bill yeah. Evans, long, long list yeah. of, is... of stars and superstars that came from and that he discovered um, or and or developed. Yeah. It's, it's, so, you know, speaking of that, we should probably talk about Lorne Michaels, uh, who you, you profile a bit in the book. And I know I've known Lorne for decades, uh, not not well, but um, and certainly uh, you, you talk about uh, uh, the story that uh, we know very well from from our people who've met with Lauren that uh, he has these conversations and interviews with talent um, that he's considering to hire. Um, and they are notoriously uncomfortable because he will stay silent for really long periods of time. 
Um, and one thing that we know from people who are in the comedy and the improv community is they like to talk. Um, so a lot of stuff gets revealed in that in, in that moment, uh, and that actually becomes a a, a management or a talent uh, recruiting technique of his, right? It it does. He's uh, he, you know he's pretty he's pretty clever. Uh, not that many people think about Lorne Michaels as you know a uh, as a real innovator in the management practice or the practice of leadership. But uh, and I didn't start stuff that way either when I started to look into what he's done. But there's no question you're mentioning a really good one with respect to kind of the, the, the talent, uh, the, the the recruiting of talent, and interviewing talent, if you will. But I also talked about talk about him quite extensively in the book and how he develops teams and. And, and it may very well be that you know Second City is exactly the same way. This combination of competition and collaboration both right. are required at the same time to excel. There are a lot of counterintuitive ideas that that uh, I came uh, that I realized super bosses were all about. And uh, you started our conversation with maybe the biggest of them all, which is letting great people go. That sounds like a crazy idea, but uh, but they do it and and they win in part because they do that. And they become these talent magnets. Well, they're also creating teams where to be successful, you need to be able to work as a, as a trooper or put together a skit that is not a stand-up comedy story, as you know, to be right. to get on, on NL. And, and at the same time, as they go through the week, they have way more material and, and, and skits and they have time. And so you have to have some sharp, uh, some sharp edges. Uh, uh, you got to be competitive, really, with the same people you're collaborating with. And you have to do it in a way that doesn't kind of people crazy that they don't want to collaborate with you. I actually think that idea has deep and wide applicability for all sorts of organizations that have you know nothing to do with uh, the entertainment industry or improv or comedy. I think those are key skills. And l- when, I, when I interviewed Lauren Nichols, um, he was talking about that very, very specifically. I don't know that he started off his career recognizing that, but over time he realized that's a management technique, if you will, that is really important. Oh, yeah. I mean, the the idea, um, you know, when we talk about um, safe spaces to fail, uh, eradicating fear uh, a, a, as a way to innovate, um, uh, a lot of people sort of respond to that, oh, it's very Pollyannic. And it's like, no, 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 that's not the deal. Um, what you need to do um, is create abundance because you're going to kill off a ton of ideas, but you need a ton of ideas. So you start in this very sort of um, uh, lovely kumbaya place where everyone, you know, creates a bunch of material. You need that to then utterly destroy your, you know, all, what they in comedy said, your babies. You're killing off your babies mm-hmm. one by one by one by one. And that's a brutal thing to sort of watch. But because this uh, idea of resiliency has been baked in and this idea of, hey, you got your ideas out there and you've got a ton of ideas and one of yours is going to hit, that makes an ensemble stronger. Um, and I, I will tell you from personal experience, you know, the people who don't make it are the ones who can't make it through that part, uh, through that editing part. Uh, and it's funny because now I'm thinking, you know, the Alice Waters mentioned her as an editor, which I, you wouldn't think of, I think, in a food uh, context. Um, but it kind of makes sense. And I mean, Chez Panisse is one of my favorite restaurants of all time. Um, but it, it is it is finely edited food, right? And and uh, Michael's finely edited uh, comedy. Uh, and then one other thing that uh, you sort of went to too, when you look at Lorne, is you know look at his uh, world he's created now uh, because of all these relationships he owns late night. You know, he, his people are overseeing, you know, all the late night shows, plus you know shows like Thirty Rock or Kimmy Schmidt. I mean, the the empire has expanded. And that's what you do when you have amazing talent that are going to move on, whether you like it or not. Tina Fey, well, well you knew Tina Fey was going to leave Second City, and I think it was pretty clear she was going to leave SNL. She's yep. just too big a talent, and she's going to have a bigger stage, and she's going to have those opportunities. Really, the question you should ask, it's so kind of obvious when we're talking about it, Kelly, which is, of course you're going to you're going to support somebody like that, but how many CEOs, how many senior executives, how many any any manager that's listening is thinking, boy, you know, uh, I don't think I've done that in the past, and it's 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 a gigantic uh, missed, lost opportunity. Yeah, and it's uh, it's one of the biggest differentiators I found of uh, 
a super boss. So I would suggest to you that Tina Fey is also a super boss, um, and in, in this regard specifically, uh, I have never seen someone manage up um, as as incredibly as, as she has. So when she w- was at Second City and I was her boss, um, she she made every great idea feel like it was my idea, um, mm-hmm. and I've seen her do that with all sorts of you know extending into her career, whether it's Lauren or Alec Baldwin, these traditionally you know imposing men. Uh, who all sort of worship at the altar of Tina. And just recently, I went to New York and helped produce an event for her. And she did the same thing, where it was the sort of like she gave over all the power uh, to me when really she was doing all the work. And it, I thought about that. You have a term in the book, uh, which uh, is called hands-on delegators. Uh, yeah. I think it's like the, it was so amazing concept. And I want you to talk a little bit about what is hands-on delegation. So hands-on delegation is another really counterintuitive idea because most people think about a a leader, a boss, as saying, well, she's a delegator or she's a micromanager, and where are you on that scale? And uh, I think superbosses have understood that that's actually way too simple of a conception of the way work actually operates. You could be, you can imagine somebody being a big delegator and a very small delegator, and you can imagine somebody being a micromanager and maybe not very much of a micromanager. And as soon as you recognize that, you say, okay, it's possible to delegate and delegate big, create big opportunities for people, but at the same time, not to forget about them, but roll up your sleeves and work with them periodically, not day to day, and definitely not doing their work. We're not talking about that, but not also ignoring them. You know, this is this is part of this apprenticeship approach to, to developing talent. And it's really it, it really requires the one to one relationship we were talking about before. So hands on delegation, every super boss did this. They were they were not afraid to put really great people into the deep end. But they also, um, they also, uh, you know, they show up on a sales call unannounced. Imagine you're going to uh, to a client, and you're, you know, you're 25 or 30 or 35 earlier in your career, and uh, the senior salesperson just happens to show up, and he, and, and she wants to see you in action. Right. And she's not going to be doing the sales call for, you, but she's going to be part of that team. All of a sudden, the bar has gone up to a gigantic level, and the best people will 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 get there, and will will get through, will go through that. And some others might might not. Hopefully, they'll learn, or they'll find it's not really the right place for them. So, hands-on delegation, I think, should be an essential um, element of uh, of of any manager. I like it because it um, speaks to the fluidity of uh, of leadership, mm-hmm. and and there's an improv term that we use um, uh, called follow the follower. It's an improv term. It's a game, um, and uh, what it gets to is uh, that in leadership, um, one has to often cede control, and a lot of people think ceding control means losing control, and we offer that no, no, no. It's it's facilitating control, uh, but occasionally you got to hand over the reins to see if 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 your people can can take. It, and then you can take those reins right back. And I think, you know, old fashioned sort of top down uh, um, hierarchies, right, um, get in the way of that. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's what you're, what, you're, what you're talking about is exactly right. And it's, um, I, I get at it a couple of ways in, um, in, in the research in the book. One is, of course, on the hierarchy point. They hate hierarchies. Their bosses will, yeah. will, will do everything they can to, to, to wipe that out. Um, to lower the, to reduce the number of barriers between people that are that are in the action versus those that are kind of sitting sitting in the head office. Nobody really sits in the head office. Everybody's involved, and uh, and, and I think that's a um, uh, that's a really big thing that they do. And then the other thing I'm, I, I want to mention is what I call the big personality paradox, and it gets to your point here, which is superbots are not exactly um, you know uh, wallflowers. They have big egos. They have accomplished a lot. They are very, very self-confident, but yet they are able to step aside and make room for other people, create those opportunities, and then step aside for them. And and that's that's akin to perhaps the follow the follower right. uh, type of uh, type of idea. Um, and and stepping aside when you when you're the key player, it's uh, it, it's interesting. I heard that about Lauren Michael a number of times from people that I interviewed. I heard that about uh, a bunch of other a bunch of other people. They they are so self-confident that they don't feel threatened by other great talents and as a result could step aside and create that incredible learning opportunity for somebody else. 
Yeah, it's hard for people to understand, right? I mean, I think it was Fitzgerald who said uh, the key to intelligence is holding two opposite ideas in your mind at the same time. And it feels counterintuitive that this, the uh, incredible super boss would, would g give up power. But that, that exactly, that that is the power, right? That they, they can wield and change. And di and it's, it works in a dynamic. And sometimes, you know, you have to, uh, as, a, as a super boss, I would imagine, worry about the color of a, a drape um, because you know that that could could be a tipping point for whatever reason. Uh, in another case, you could be sitting in the back while major policy decisions are, are going on, and they, they you know, I, I, I would guess that they know the difference. They know when to step in and when to step out. Ralph Lauren was exactly that. You know, he'd be uh, he'd, he'd he'd be redressing the uh, uh, the dummies before a show mm -hmm. uh, if he thought that they were off. And other times, he'd have this tremendous. I mean, he produced incredible talent. From, you know, Tori Birch and Vera Wang and Joseph Abud and yeah. and uh, John Idol is the CEO of Michael Kors now. I mean, tremendous. So he'd have he'd have the right type of people. The counterintuitive nature of what super bosses do is in many ways the most interesting part of the story. And 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 we've talked about a bunch of them from the big personality paradox to to, to this idea that talent retention is not really what you should be optimizing on to this combining this hands-on delegation and competition and collaboration within a team. And, and the way I look at it is so much of, of people management and leadership is, is, is really not gotten that much better over time. When I'm talking to CEOs, that's their number one question, their number one problem. It's all about talent and, and, and creating better and stronger leaders. Ten years ago, the same question was coming up. It seems like with, with all the changes that have gone on in enterprise and organizations, all the innovations, the single most important area, the people side, is the area that's seen perhaps the least innovation. And so maybe it is the right time to be thinking about some of these and employing some of these counterintuitive ideas. Business as usual hasn't really changed the equation very much. And super bosses do things in ways that sound a little bit odd, but they've, they've demonstrated the results. And other models have, haven't. So I think it's the right time. Totally. Yeah. Well, people fear that people are scared. And when they're scared, they look to control. And a lot of the super boss stuff is, is really it's, it's losing control and let, letting things fly. I'm curious. So when I wrote my book, um, uh, which was essentially about innovation and creativity through this improv lens, um, we talked a lot about leadership. It really made me think a lot about not only my own uh, style of leadership, but how I've been mentored. And, and my boss, Andrew Alexander at Second City, took a amazing chances on me and allowed me to fail a bunch uh, and, and really helped, helped guide my career. I'm curious about you and thinking about your bosses. Did that enter into the fray of like, oh, God, th this is the kind of boss I've had over time uh, or, or, you know, the other way that you were looking for a leader that, that you didn't have? Yeah. Uh, well, one of my, uh, my primary advisor in my academic uh, career was very much of a super boss. I even, I even mention him and talk about him a little bit in the book. His name is Don Hambrick, and longtime, very successful professor. It's a huge track record developing leading uh, leading scholars in the world of leadership, strategy, and the like. And uh, he uh, he did a bunch of things that are very similar to what super bosses do. When, when that was happening to me, some you know two or three decades ago, I wasn't thinking about it. It's only upon reflection, you know, when I'm mm -hmm. when I've been doing this research and talking to so many people about super bosses and learning about it that it occurred to me finally, hey. You know, I actually had a bit of an experience like that under uh, under the under Don uh, in in the day, and um, sometimes you don't even know what's going on in real time. But then you look back and say, "Wow, that that really did have a big impact." Because it was all about. I'll give you one little anecdote. It's going to sound kind of obvious, but unfortunately, in the world of academia, it's not obvious. Hmm. Early project we were working on was on, of all things, executive compensation, yeah. and he told me. Uh, in academia, this is a big topic. Economists are always ta studying this and looking at this. And he said to me, go find some compensation consultants that are at the top of their field. Call up, go see them, and ask them whether they would care what we'd find or not. Does it mean anything to them? We'd figure out what that personal relationships and social connections, which is what we were getting at, if that would have a difference in how much people got paid. In other words, who you knew as opposed to what you actually knew, mm -hmm. which, of course, seems like... Uh, Something we understand in a lot of different, a lot of different dimensions. It turns out the compensation consultant said, said to us, the, said to me, the economists are are dominating these ideas. It's all about maximizing performance and all kinds of ideas. But when you get right down to it, individual human relationships make a giant difference in whether people and how much people get paid, especially as CEOs. It would be great to be able to quantify and document that. It turns out that 
that's a lesson I share with younger or newer academics all the time. Why not find out if the real world actually cares about it, cares mm-hmm. about that innovation? It's very, being very customer-focused. It turns out to be an unusual idea at the time and even today in parts of academia. And I feel like it actually has spurred me on to take on some of these big projects like, like what, what's become the Super Boss book, where it's all about looking for innovation, all about looking for new ideas, all about looking for what real managers, real leaders really care about and try to help them figure out how to do it better. So you've kind of already shared one story that fits this, but we, we, we close the podcast normally uh, because it is called Yes And uh, with, with a question for, for you that, you know, at some point in your career, did you have a Yes And moment, uh, you know, where you could have said no and things would have gone this way, but instead you said Yes And and, and something transformational for good or, or for bad happened? Is, is, is there a story from your career? I, I, I did, and it's, uh, it's actually a story... Um, that might be a little bit different than some others in the sense that it, is, it was my reaction to someone that was 100% yes, but, mm-hmm. and it changed my life. Um, and it was early in my career where I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, was, uh, I, I actually, I was working as an accountant of all things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got a review from my supervisor, the manager, senior, uh, I was really a partner, and um, you know, how are you doing and everything. And I was, uh, I, I was doing a great job. He had a lot of, a lot of praise. And he, so that was the yes. And then he said, but this is what the problem is. He, and you know what he said? He what? said to me, you asked too many questions. <laughs> and it was, it was as if, you know, someone had just thrown me, uh, thrown cold water over my head. Um, and I thanked him. I said, thank you so much for that feedback. And I was, uh, I was in my 20s, and I'm kind of impressed that I was calm enough to say that. And... Uh, uh, and that was my last day as an accountant. I quit the next day. Uh, it's funny. My son just started an internship uh, as a senior in high school, and he said, do you have any advice? And I said, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, well, that's the best advice you can give. And I, I think about it. I've made a career out of asking questions and looking for answers. That's what kind of what I do for a living. Yeah, exactly. Look where it got you. Hey, Sydney, thank you so much. The, the book is called Super Bosses. I highly recommend uh, that everyone pick it up, and thank you for being our guest. Thank you, Kelly. This has been uh, Second City Works Getting to Yes And. I'm the creative advisor for the Second City, Kelly Leonard, and we'll be back next week. Thanks. This is Second City Works, Getting to Yes And. You can find us at WGNplus.com. You can stream us on the WGN Plus app, or you can find us on iTunes. See you next week.